Thank you, Rock. Thank you so much. You could be seated. Thank you so much. I'm honored. I'm overwhelmed. I'm touched. I do not have enough adjectives nor verbs to tell you um, how special. And this is really messed up because I have to preach after all this emotion that has gone on on this stage. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Now, I just want you to know that I'm going to be as long-winded as I possibly can be because I don't know when I'm going to be able to wear a robe again, so I want to just make sure that I get my fill of this robe. I wish I had a beanie to wear, one of their beanies, but I don't have a beanie. But anyways, we're just going to enjoy this together, and thanks a million. Let's pray together. Father, oh, no. <laughs> That's like a baker's hat. I want a real beanie with a real vato loco, East L.A., Monteveo beanie. Father, thank you for this amazing moment right now. I need your help. I pray, Lord, that you're going to minister to every single one of us today, and we give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, iPhones, you simply want to listen. I'm going to turn over to 1 Peter 2 and verse number 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse number 9. It's a familiar verse, but it goes something like this. And I want to emphasize the you in this verse. It says, but you are a chosen generation. If you'll allow me, I'll say, you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are his own special people. That you should proclaim the praise of him that called you out of darkness. Isn't it amazing as we look around to see all the various darknesses that God drew us out of? He drew us out of these darknesses and he brought us into a marvelous light who once were not the people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained God's unmerited loving kindness and his goodness called mercy. You know, there's a story told of a missionary, and he's a prayer warrior, and he was living on the border of two countries that were battling, two nations. It was a war zone that was going on. And he got up really, really early in the morning, and he just began to pray. And before you knew it, he had walked several, several miles until he got to a, an area where the border patrol was and some military men with machine guns met him and, put, and stopped him and said two words to him. Who are you and what are you doing here? He felt that that was so profound that he needed to ask himself every single day, who are you and what are you doing here? And it's amazing that you and I can go our whole lifetime never really understanding that. Who am I and what am I really doing here? Am I just to be a plumber? Am I to be a landscaper? Am I to be a doctor? Am I to be a business? Am I to be a mother? Am I to be a father? That's wonderful, but is there a greater assignment, a greater purpose to build God's kingdom? Who are you and what are you doing here? So I want to talk just for a moment the incredible value of you. The incredible value that you bring into the kingdom of God. It's amazing to me if you can begin to discover who you are and begin to develop who you are. And begin to deploy who you are. Oh my God, how better would this world be if we could get you to discover who you really are. And begin to develop who you really are so that you can deploy who you really are. Have you ever admired somebody? Have you ever respected somebody? Have you ever been in awe of somebody? Like a a Mother Teresa or a a Nelson Mandela or a a Billy Graham or a Jib and Deborah Cobray? It was because they discovered themselves, they developed themselves, and they deployed themselves. But have you ever been hurt by somebody or disappointed by somebody? It's because they didn't do themselves really, really well. In an overpopulated world of 7.6 billion people, there you are, like searching and looking for Waldo, or one star in the whole universe, there you are. You are unique, and you are special. And the quirky smile that you have, and the one tooth that you have, and the uneven ears, and the big feet, that's what makes you unique. Your DNA is different. Your personality is different. Your hair is different. Your experiences are different. Your life is different. 
And I just want to hear you today that you need to stop running away from how God created you and start stepping into who God created you to be and let God use you. But it's amazing how we spend our whole lifetime dogging ourselves, talking down to ourselves. We're nobody. Somebody compliments you. Oh, this whole thing. You look good today. Oh, I don't look that good today. What is it within us? that makes us so insecure. Maybe if you and I can overcome those insecurities, we rise to the potential that God wants us to be in the kingdom of God. I just turned 57 years old, and it's taken me 57 years to start liking myself. And now that I'm starting to like myself, I feel that I'm soaring higher than I've ever been before. And I'm just here to tell you, over these next few moments, I want you to get to that point because we're all born originals. But most of us will die copies. And when you try to be like somebody else, the best you could be is number two. So I'm going to share with you a scripture. It's found in John, the third chapter, if you would, please. The Bible also says in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Before, uh, excuse me, be, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. It's amazing the incredible value that you are uniquely and wonderfully made. There's no duplicate of you. JB, I'm going to call him John the Baptist or JB today, is going to begin to share with us four principles how you and I can begin to discover, deploy, and develop you. We're going to call him JB for John the Baptist. It's going to go like this. John, verse 1 and verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19. Now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, watch this, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you a prophet? He said, no way. And they said to him, then who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Now, here's what JB is going to say about himself. He's going to say, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elisha the prophet? John answered and said to them, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to lose. Four things that JB is going to teach us today. See, because if I could get you today to start doing you really, do, do, doing you really good, you won't be jealous anymore. You won't be envious anymore. You won't have to copy anymore, anymore anyone. You won't have to be in competition to anybody because you'll recognize I'm an original. In all that God created me, and if I just do myself really, really well, I'll be a blessing in the kingdom of God. Someday someone will come up to you and say, thank God for you being you. I struggled for years. I struggled for years with the issues that I had within myself because we're all byproduct of our experiences, our associations, the environment that we grew up. And it's amazing what happened to us at five years old, eight years old, 12 years old, 16 years old. Sticks with us for the rest of our lives. And God's saying, get over it. I've got so much more. Dream bigger, do more. But you're holding on to the past. Like an eagle whose wings clips, you never can soar. Because you're still looking at what happened to you. See, I was a little boy. It's not a big thing. But I had really big thighs. No, don't laugh. Because then I'm going to get hurt. But anyways, I had really big thighs. So when we went, now, young people, please understand, we didn't get a thousand pair of, of jeans to choose from. You just had Sears and Roebuck Levi jeans. And when you put them on, it took you a year to break them in. Because you walk like this. Well, I couldn't go to the regular store. Again, I had to go to the hefty section where the big boys are because I needed the big jeans. I said, Mom, I want to buy the regular jeans. She said, you can't fit into the regular jeans. you got to wear the big boy jeans. 
And so all the kids would call me big thighs and they laugh at me and, and I felt like I was inadequate and I felt like I didn't measure up. But lo and behold, when I became a teenager, I didn't realize that these big thighs would make me run fast. I didn't realize these big thighs would make me ride really good on a bicycle. And I didn't realize these big thighs would allow me to swim. And what I was crying about and complaining about and moaning about was actually a gift that God had given me. Is it possible that even though the heartache and the brokenness and the injustice and the abuse that happened to you, God could use it to make you a story, make you a testimony, give you a platform that nobody else can have? So here's what JB would tell you. Number one is this. You are just as valuable to Jesus in his ministry as I was. As valuable as I was to Jesus' ministry is just as invaluable as you are. My assignment, JB would say, is just as your assignment is just as important. Now you push back and say, oh, no way, JB. You're so much greater and you're so much more. And JB would come back and say, my assignment was to prepare the way of the Lord. Is that not your assignment to prepare the way of the Lord? My assignment, I was a voice crying out in the wilderness of my generation. Are you not supposed to be voices that cry out in the generation? I was a messenger of Jesus. Are you not a messenger of Jesus? I was to, to, to decrease while he increased. Are not you supposed to decrease so that he can increase? I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. Don't you walk in that humility too? Well, if you say it that way, JB, I guess so. I'm not some less than version, wannabe version. You know, how many of you know there's a difference between Louis Vuitton and Lou Vinton bags? How many of you know there's a difference between leather and plethora? You're not a less than version. You're an original. You're God's best. He's, you are the best that God has. And you've got to get over yourself and realize that. Even with all my inadequacies and all my things that I deal with, I want you to know you could be like me and have attention deficit disorder. They didn't diagnose it back then, but that's what I had. You could be an obsessive behavior. I had that as a little boy. But I didn't know that that would be what would drive me to become the man that I am today. So I just want you to know when I was a little boy, uh, you weren't anybody if you didn't have Converse. The Converse was the toughest, baddest shoe that any kid wore. Now, Converse only came in three colors back then, black, red, and white. They didn't come in all kinds of colors. I don't know if it was that you could jump faster, you could run faster, you, you were stronger if you had Converse. Well, my mom and dad couldn't afford Converse. They could afford Keds. And so that's what we got. We got Keds. And my mom said, kids are just as good as Converse. And I said, oh, no, they're not. They're not. They're a wannabe. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're an original Converse, and you could do what God's told you to do. The second thing JB would tell you is this, is that you need to know who you are, and you need to know who you aren't. He's very clear when they say, are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? No, I'm not a prophet. Are you Christ? Definitely not Christ. And so if you're going to begin to develop you and discover you and deploy you, you got to know who you are and you got to know who you aren't. Because people are going to try to label you. And people are going to try to put categories on you. And people are going to try to put classes on you. And people are going to try to put restrictions on you and limitations on you. And tell you how much you can achieve and where you can live and what you can own. And they're going to try to label you, whether that is the label of Elijah or whoever. And there's got to be a pushback that you know who you are. And I know who I'm not. And JB is clear to tell us that. That I am not a label. And here's what I'm saying to you. You're not a label. You're not a classification. You're not a restriction. You're not a diagnosis. Prognosis. You're not a, any of the a status you're not a reputation. You're not a look. Who are you? You are what God says you are. 
Those are the labels. Are we going to carry the labels of the world or are we going to carry the labels of God? Because if you allow yourself, the world will label you and you'll live out that label in your lifestyles, in your relationships, in your choices, in your decisions, in your responsibilities, and how you think and how you live. You'll live according to the label that the world has placed upon you, the classifications that the label has placed upon you. You're somebody who has a record. That's a label. You're somebody that's been diagnosed with a sickness. That's a label. You're somebody that has this level of education. That's a label. You're somebody with this GPA. That's a label. You're somebody with this IQ. That's a label. You've been divorced three times with six children. That's a label. But you got to push back and say, no, I am not that label. Because that label is going to turn me into an attitude, an emotion. Uh, it's going to drive my decisions, got to drive my choices. I am what the Bible says. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir of God. I'm chosen. I'm the beloved. I'm blessed. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. And that drives my relationship. That drives my choices. That drives my decisions. That drives my responsibility. That drives my obligation. It's not confusing what to do if I know who I really am. If I don't know who I really am, then I'm confused at what to do. So you and I have to be an individual that pushes back. In 2008, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer, stage four, told how long I would live. I had a choice to accept that label, to accept that diagnosis, to accept that outcome, or to push back and let God tell me what my future is and let God tell me who I am and tell me what he could do for me. So I chose to believe God's report. I chose to stand on the word. I chose to believe God for my healing. And you're going to have to do the same. I want you to recognize there's a great picture I want to show you. It's Augustus Landmaster. It's 1936. I don't know if they'll be able to show it to you, of Augusta Landmaster. Um, no, Augusta? Oh, I'm sorry. This was taken in 1936. World War, World War II will break out in 1941. I don't know if you could see it. All these soldiers are giving the salute of Hitler. Augustus, the guy circled, look at what he's doing with his hands. He's rejecting it. He's saying there's something wrong with this man. I'm not saluting him and I will not follow him. And that's what you got to do. You got to reject the labels of this world when everyone is saying this is the lifestyle. This is what's politically correct. This is what's acceptable. This is what social media is saying. This is how, how, how many of you ever heard this say? You all are the same. You all look the same. No, we're not all the same, and we don't look the same. We don't all like rap music and play it a mile away. And psh, 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 psh. There they go, one of them. How do you know I might like country music? Bootin', scootin', boogie. I don't know. But don't label me, man. Don't classify me. The third thing that JB would tell you and I is that we have such a short time, such a short time to do what Jesus has asked us to do. And that's why we cannot be out of service. And that's why we cannot be inactive. And that's why we cannot be out of order like a bathroom or a vending machine or a taxi cab. We got to be busy in the kingdom. I've got a short time. And here's the amazing thing about JB. He lives 30 years. He's in preparation for 30 years for a six-month ministry. And then he will spend a few more months in prison, and then he's beheaded. 30 years. 30 years. I'm sure he said, why can't I be like John? He never dies. He's going to live to be an old man. Why can't I be Pil Peter, one of the pillars of the church? Why am I going to spend 30 years? And that's why you and I cannot get into comparison with other people's callings and other people's gifts and other people's ministry. You just simply do what God has asked you to do, and your reward will be just as great. You don't have to talk like nobody, sing like anybody, preach, walk, serve, love. When I began to overcome myself, I used to get so frustrated because I said, you know what? 
I'm not like Joel Osteen. I don't smile. I look like I'm angry all the time and I'm fighting all the time and I'm mad all the time. Nobody will listen to me. Nobody will like me. But I realized one person does. Like Sammy Davis Jr., I gotta be me. I gotta be me. You just gotta be you. You're not Joel and you're not anybody else. You're quir quirky you. Weird you. What's normal? What's normal? Tell me what normal is. Please define that. Tell me what the, the most handsome, cutest, bestest looking. Who comes up with that? A magazine? A talk show? The best looking man on the planet? George Clooney? Oh my God. They've not seen Pastor Jim. Jim should be the best looking man in the planet. Who comes up with these things? And we sit there and we admire that some woman, no disrespect, is a size zero, and that's a perfect body? Give me a break. Where do we come up with these things? So JB would say, guys, we don't have forever. I had such a short time. And if I didn't do what the Lord had called me to do, I don't know if Jesus' ministry would have been prolonged. I don't know what would have happened. You are so connected to Christ in your ministry that sometimes if you don't do what God's asked you to do, there's not going to be a replacement. There's not going to be another. And then sometimes if you don't do it, God has to raise up and wait to raise up someone else. JB would tell you, please, guys, you don't have forever. Let's get busy now doing what God's told us to do. The average human being lives 27, 365 days a year. If you're 25 years old, you have 18,250 days left. If you're 50 years old, you have 9,125 days. If you're 65 years old, you have 3,650 days left. And we'll just stop there so we don't get depressed. <laughs> you have a short time. This short time consists of passing the tests of love and character God has for you. It consists of you and I a short time to, to live out trust, which means steward what God has given you. We have a short time to pass the trials that God has for us of sacrificing and crucifying the flesh, of thankfulness and living a life of appreciation, of testimony, of sharing our faith and touching others, which is serving. As I begin to close this out, you've got to make a decision that God can disturb you. Can God really disturb you? Jonah didn't want to be disturbed, but Esther fought through and was willing to be disturbed. And you got to say, I'm willing to make myself disturbable. I read a book or heard of a guy, and I, his name was Bob Goff, and he gave his personal phone number out to over a million people. It was a bestseller. He provoked me. He, he's a successful lawyer, and he gave out his personal phone number. And I said, you know, I'm competitive. I'm competitive naturally, and I'm competitive spiritually. I said, if that guy can give out his phone number, he's willing to be disturbed. He, he used to get 100 phone calls a day. Now he gets 40 calls a day, and his goal is to never let it go to voice ring. They're not always pleasant calls, but he wants to be disturbed and make him. He's, uh, they asked him, why do you take these calls from crazy people? Because he says, if it stops somebody from going to a high-rise building and shooting people to talk to me, cuss me out, or do whatever, I'm willing to do that. He provoked me. To be disturbed. So I got in front of my church and I gave out my personal email to everybody. And I said, disturb me. Disturb me. Now, I, I'm not going to do it for rock, but I did it for abundant living. Because <laughs> so I don't want to be that disturbed. <laughs> I can handle rancho issues. I can't handle San Bernardino issues. <laughs> Donald Ritchie. If you Google the top ten places where people commit suicide... You'll go, to Glo you'll go to Dover's Cliffs in, uh, in Australia. And you'll see about 100 yards from these cliffs, a man named Donald Ritchie has gone on to heaven. He's called the Angel in the Gap. He saved over 160 people before they jumped. He would sneak up on them so not to spook them. And he'd say, hi, I'm Donald Ritchie. I live over there, that house, 100 yards. I saw you out my window. And I don't know what you're about ready to do, and I don't want to talk you out of it, but I'm just going to ask you to one thing. Would you come up to my house and have a spot of tea with me before you do whatever you do? 
After having the spot of tea, he told them how valued and important they were, and he talked 160 people. He was allowed himself to be disturbed. The last point, and I'm done, is this. JB would tell you, when you begin to discover yourself and develop yourself and deploy yourself and start doing yourself well, there's no greater profit that you will bring to Jesus than that. There's no greater profit to him. But you know what? To do that, you and I are going to have to get over ourselves. Plain and simple. You're going to have to get over your fears, your insecurities, your past, your shames, your guilts, your sins. Stop saying anybody could do it. Well, if, any, if anyone could do it, they'd be doing it, but they're not doing it. So do what God's told you to do. There's no greater profit than you being you and doing you really, really well. So as I close this out, I want to say this. If it was no big deal, everyone be doing it. If it was no big deal, the devil wouldn't be so mad. If it was no big deal, then someone will not thank God for you. It is a big deal because someone, something will continue to exist. And it is a big deal because no one has to do your job. You have personalities, experience, stories, skills, abilities, passions, interests, even struggles that God wants to use but you're going to have to get over the issues of your life and let God use you in spite of. What I was going to show you was, how many have ever heard of Mr. Rogers? And at the end of this show, Mr. Rogers would come and he began to take off his sweater and put on his shoes and he'd talk about there's nobody like you and nobody can do what you can do. Well, there was an African-American man. His name was Mr. Clemens. He worked 30 years on the show in a time where there was racism going on. Mr. Rogers handpicked him to be on the show. There's one point where they're in a swimming pool and both their feet are in the water, which was very controversial at the time. And Mr. Rogers handed him a towel and wiped his feet. Everybody thought that Mr. Rogers was just a little bit quirky, but he had a purpose. He knew what he was doing. So at the end of a show that had finished every single time the same way, Mr. Rogers was looking at Mr. Clemens and said, there's nobody like you, and you're unique, and you're special. And after this show, Mr. Clemens went up to him and said, Mr. Rogers, you were looking at me. Were you talking to me? And Mr. Rogers said, I've been talking to you for 30 years looking at you, but you heard me for the first time. And God is telling you today, I've been telling you how valuable you are so many times, but you're going to hear it today for the first time. Father, I just pray today in the name of Jesus, whatever our hurts are, whatever our hangups are, whatever our issues are, that you just set us free of those things. Father, we don't have, want to have one regret in our lives that we didn't finish our course, that we dream too small. God, I just pray, Lord, that we're doing big things for you, God. I'd rather set big goals and fall and fail than not to set big goals at all. I pray that there are big feet in this place, big dreamers in this place, big eagles in this place, people that want to do great things in the kingdom of God. I pray in the name of Jesus that their gifts are stirred up. I pray for gifts to be activated in the kingdom of God. I pray that every single person in here, from the graduates to those that are watching, they understand their assignment. What is the God-given purpose why God placed them on this planet? Who are the people they are called to reach? Where are the places that they are called? And what is the purpose behind all that you brought them through, saved them from accidents, drugs, incarcerations? Why? And I pray that gift is now activated in this local church, God, and in the churches that you have them, God. May they build their local church and be servants of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to me.